Welcome to the Scoop Board Art and happy Friday. We have a shocking transfer portal ad. We have a huge uh, recruiting weekend coming. Our South Florida Express boys are all up here. Uh, a lot to break down. Student Appreciation Day is tomorrow. Uh, a lot of moving parts for the football team, the basketball team. We'll get into all of that. Uh, the portal is popping, and I'm stunned by this new edition. So we're going to uh, break all of it down for you. As always, thank you guys for tuning in uh, each and every day. Thank you so much. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also, click that little alert bell. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. What are you guys up to this weekend? Uh, is it still March of Madness for you guys? Uh, we're getting into April pretty quick here. Spring game is two weeks away. Our get-together will be on April 13th, 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Buffalo Wild Wings, corner of Lane and High, about a mile or so from the stadium. So if you guys will stop by, have a beer, eat some chicken wings, and head into the game, that'd be amazing. It'd be appreciated. We're having an awesome uh, crew there. So I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of you guys. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Got to get right into it with my boy, Nevada. Nevada, we always are brainstorming topics about what to talk about, what's going on in the world of Ohio State football, specifically football, because our show is 99% football. And he said, well, let's talk about the transfer portal. And I was like, okay, new transfer portal. And you're like, yeah, we got another running back. And I was like, okay, why? Um, but we did. And uh, it's a kid who... Uh, uh, is a redshirt senior this year, K. Ron Lynch Adams. He's from Warren Harding High School, same high school as from Race Claret and Boom Heron. Um, excited for him, but it's a pretty crowded backfield, in my opinion. Uh, your thoughts when you found out that we took a, a commitment from another running back, uh, K. Ron Lynch Adams, uh, from UMass, um, and a former Warren Harding Raider. Yeah, it's this is a weird one because you know it kind of came out of left field, you know, waiting to see the the formal announcement. Obviously, you got the the UMass insider crystal ball on this thing, and you know, by all indications from people inside, this is happening. But it's weird because you know, K. Ron Lynch Adams is a guy that you know, he, he left or was leaving UMass, going to declare for the draft, um, and actually was. You know, pretty, I won't say well regarded by the NFL, but it, he, he was a draftable prospect. I mean, he was going to get drafted for sure. And then it's going to go back to UMass and then decided, no, I'm going to put re enter the portal. And it looks like, you know, coming back to Ohio State. So if that happened, I mean, crazy ad. Now, what does that mean? You know, instantly your thoughts go, what does that mean for Dallin Hayden? What does that mean for James Peoples? You know, like, and, and I'm not sure what to make of it because this, all this information is, you know, very fresh. This is all broke in like the last 30 minutes, but it's certainly interesting. You know, you know, to me, what it would indicate, you know, if this were to come to fruition, which we have every reason to believe that it would, but if it does, it just, it, it, another indicator that Ohio state is really kind of, you know, reloading, going all in for 2024. Um, we've talked ad nauseum about how long this, the season is, how difficult the schedule is. And, you know, it's not like Ohio State hasn't ever been their third or fourth or fifth running back. And, you know, you don't have to go in the way back machine to, to go there. Just go back a couple of years and, you know, you're going to, hey, who's going to play running back today? I guess we're going to go to the former walk on Xavier Johnson or something. I mean, we've been that far there and you can never have enough quality guys. You can never have enough NFL capable running backs in your stable. Um but this one, this one definitely came out of left field. Sometimes we like to feel that we've got a, a pretty decent handle on things. But this one, I hadn't heard anything about this from anybody until uh, until this broke. So uh, I'm, just, I'm I guess I'm playing along with everybody else. I'm, I'm kind of uh, semi stunned, semi trying to figure out exactly what it means. But if it comes to pass, I, I'd be excited about it. I, I, like I said, I I just do not think. You can ever have enough players. And, I, you know, my mantra is always, let's make it unfair. And if this guy helps us to make it unfair and, and um, you know, he's a guy that can help us in game eight in the third quarter because two guys have pulled hamstrings, hey, I'm all about that. Um, never can have enough good players, and I'd be excited about the ad. Yeah, I mean, I'm shocked by this just because we've had such a – I mean, we have the top two tailbacks, in my opinion, in the country. And again, I'm I'm biased, but I'm really not. I mean, Trey Henderson's better than anybody in the country. And then, you know, uh, Quinshawn Jodkins is 
right there. So it's uh, this is strange. And then right behind them, you have Dallin Hayden. And Dallin Hayden has had one of the weirdest careers I've ever seen in the history of Ohio State football where he's bounced around. He's been active. He's been a starter. I mean, as a freshman, he saved the day versus Maryland. Then last year, uh, plays again in a game, and then he's not good enough to play. And I, I don't know. I mean, this is a weird one. I mean, I'm happy for the kid. I mean, I, you know, obviously being an Ohio native, and he's obviously a kid that Ohio State didn't consider coming out because he ended up at UMass, so he didn't have great offers coming out of high school. But he's been productive in college. So I mean, um, it's just it's a very interesting guy to add to the mix at this point, just because. You know, like, what does it mean for James Peoples? I think he's out the door. Um, and I'm not speculating on that. But, I mean, you know, if you're adding a tailback who's this old, who's a fifth-year guy. I mean, there aren't many fifth-year tailbacks that you take at Ohio State unless he's good enough or he's just, he might just love Ohio State or he, want, he wants to be a special teamer and, like, a, a, a late game back, I guess. But, I mean, is he really better than Dallin Hayden? I mean, I can't imagine that, but... It's uh shocking, you know. He's um uh signed with Rutgers, had offers from Iowa, Cincinnati, but yeah, you know, I mean, he was out of high school in twenty twenty. You know, we're in twenty twenty four, so it's been a long time since uh since commitment. I mean, he literally would have committed pre coronavirus, which is nuts. But I uh you know, I don't I don't know if this guy gets drafted. I mean, if a guy like this declares like maybe seventh round, I mean, it's hard like. I've seen really good running backs at Ohio State like try to get drafted and late and think they're productive and they don't. So I mean, if you're at UMass, you better be running for two thousand yards and twenty touchdowns, or else it's not really uh, it doesn't really compute. But I think uh, it, it'll be interesting. Like I mean, we get this kid, be exciting. Nevada, if we get K. Ron Lynch Adams, I mean, what type of role would do you, could you envision him having? Because again, this is a he's running the best running back room we've ever seen. It would be like signing a another cornerback or another safety. Um, how excited could you get about a kid like this? Well, look, I, I'm excited. About, again, we're assuming this is true, so let's let's make sure that we've issued all the necessary disclaimers. We're assuming that this is true. If it does happen, it would be weird because you know his role. You, 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 Look, all the running backs are behind Trey and behind Quinshawn. So, and they know that. And so that's why when, you know, when yeah, I immediately got flooded with people asking, well, what does this mean for James Peoples? And I wouldn't think it would mean all that much because this guy is a one year deal. I mean, Quinshawn, Trey, and, you know, um, you know, and, and K Ron would all be gone next year. So, and James Peoples can't possibly be coming and thinking, you know, 2024 is my year. This is when I'm going to really shine. You know, I'm going to take carries from Trey. I'm going to take carries from Quinshawn. I'm going to take carries from Dallin Hayden, and I'm going to really light it up. So I wouldn't imagine it has anything. That, that doesn't mean to say that there's no peril with James Peoples or that there's no story going on there or there's not re-recruiting that Ohio State has to do there. But I'm not sure this would be the uh, the straw that would break the, the, the camel's back on that. Um, this just sounds to me, if it were true, if it were to happen, that this is a kid who wants to come home, want you know, Warren Harding kid wants to play his last year as a Buckeye, and um, as I said, you know, what his role his role would be insurance policy. His role would be, hey, you know, it's it's not like Trey Henderson has had a career that's been you know devoid of injury. It's not like you know we haven't needed our third run. Like you talked about Don Hayden, you know, bailing us out. I mean, what was he that year? Was it the fourth running back that year when he bailed us out? And there wasn't much behind him at that point. So I just don't think you could ever have enough players. Um, you know, I, I do think this this kid probably would have been drafted, but, you know, maybe six rounds, seven, eight. It would have been a late-round pick. Um, but interesting ad for sure. You know, strictly an insurance policy, but it would be an interesting one if it were true. So um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think, I, I think this will probably, you know, be resolved – in the next 24, 48 hours. And, and I'm interested to see how it, it all kind of unfolds, but um, really a strange, strange story. But Hey, when Quinshawn Judkins went on the portal and I first read that and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to speak for you, Kirk, but I, I would, I would guess that your thought first when you read that was ain't no way Quinshawn Judkins is coming to Ohio state 
as long as Trey Henderson's here. Because I know that was my thought. So um, would this be the strangest ad of all time? No, because Quinchon Judkins already took the cake on that one, and it's been that kind of a crazy year. So maybe it just keeps uh, keeps getting crazier here during the, uh, the 2024 offseason. Yeah, and we also added London Merritt today, which is a, a huge get, a kid that we've broken down uh, the last few weeks. He committed to Ohio State, four-star D lineman from Atlanta, Hotlanta. Uh, picked us over Bama, SC, Oregon. Um, again, he said that he wanted to choose a program that mirrors his hunger and pursuit for greatness, and Ohio State is the program. So he must be very hungry, so he picked Ohio State. So McClick is film on. That is a nice little day today. I mean, we, we knew that the SFE kids were getting in. They got in yesterday. Um, there's some really good players from South Florida Express uh, that are getting the whole tour from Ryan Day and the crew. Um, big shout out to Mark Pantoni. Mark, this is when Mark Pantoni is playing left tackle here. You can see him right here. It says Mark right there. So, like, he was playing against London Merritt last uh Last fall um, in high school football, so this is, this is really good. Um, happy for him. Uh, great job getting us uh, another black guy. Appreciate that. Um, but, Nevada, your thoughts on London Merritt? He's a big dude. Uh, apparently in Georgia, in Atlanta, where football is really big, uh, they don't love blocking anybody. Because the sport, I mean, I just don't know what, what is this guy supposed to do. Oh, my God. Look at this. Imagine being this running back right here and you're just like, yeah. And again, like this, I mean, this technique is just absolutely terrible by this offense. This entire offensive line, but like this guard, I've never seen a more upright guard. I mean, I, I this has to be a trap. I mean, the, the, he, he has to be trapping this guy and he's just got his eyes closed, but like this, this poor, this poor running back. But again, this is like, this is like watching an NFL draft highlight where they say, oh, he's a dominating upfield, disruptive player. And it's like literally, like, literally, like, dog, you know, uh, uh, Funky could run a field and, and make this hit and get a loss of five and a minus, you know, four on the stat sheet, tackle for loss. But it's like, I, this, these are the plays that drive me crazy. Because I'm like, the O-line completely <laughs> screws up. They don't block anybody. And it's not a read. And this poor running back, like, catches, he gets the ball. And immediately loses four yards. But uh, your thoughts? Disruptive player, obviously can get upfield and kill guys when there's nobody blocking him. But otherwise, I think he looks pretty good. I mean, I don't know if he grows into D tackle, but I just like I watch, I watch some of this film. Like, look at the center. I mean, this Pantone again at center. He transferred. And I'm just like, what in the world is going on? But uh, your thoughts, Nevada? I think he's a, he's an IMG kid now. I, I, I think that, that that must be IMG and that the famed uh, Bishop Sycamore or Bishop Sycamore <laughs> light that they're playing against or something like that. So yeah. those guys, they do get some uh, oh some of those cl cl classic uh, classic opponents when they're playing out there. But no, uh, like this is a kid Ohio State really wanted, a kid they were really excited about their prospects of getting. And um you know, I, I, look, it's you never know with the, the kids down south. You never know that the, the commitments are going to stick. But he seems pretty excited. Ohio State seems pretty excited, and they feel like this one's going to going to be seen through all to the end. I know we've heard that before with recruiting, but um, I feel like this this kid really fits at Ohio State, and you know, great at. I mean, he's got all the measurables, everything that you want on a defensive lineman, and uh, this is the kind of players you're looking. For. These are the kind of difference makers that can help you win national championships. I mean, he's disruptive. Like, I think he's got a lot of upside. It'll be interesting if he slots in an end or tackle. Yeah, he's playing a lot of tackle here, but, I mean, he's also playing against, like, you know, the sisters of the poor. I mean, these, some of these teams are just so bad when you watch their film. But he's a, he's a twitched-up dude, good player. It, it always helps with the quarterback that throws the ball on the ground for no reason. Um, but there he gets off a double team, disruptive. But, uh, again, like... Kids like this are always interesting because their highlight tapes are incredible. Obviously, he's a very good player. But, you know, how does he adjust to playing, like, real players, like real teams, real O-linemen, not like uh, – again, like, I don't I don't know what this is. Like, look at these kids. Like, look at this right guard. It's like this right guard has no idea that he could be blocking 34. So, again, I think this kid's going to be really good. Because, again, he's twitchy. He's athletic. 
you put him in a camp setting, he probably dominates everybody. But, you know, I mean, here he's he's dominating a, what looks like a bunch of eighth graders, which is great. And this is, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, this is illegal motion, which, of course, like, they don't call in high school. Like, 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 look at this motion. Like, what? You know, I mean, I, I know George is like, the, is like the godson of football, but you can't do like a, a giant U for a motion. Like, look at this kid. This kid, is he in Can is this Toronto, Ontario, Canada? Like, what is he doing? I mean, like, I, I again, I, I know that there's like officials that are just awful, but like, this guy literally goes from he's on the fifty, and then he loops back to like the forty nine, and then then he lines up on the fifty again, and I'm like, and 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 then he gets set, or no, I mean, I mean, holy cow. I mean, this is, I mean, this is bad football around, but I mean, he's a really good player. Thank Christ, but holy God. Um, but yeah, this kid's a disruptor, big time player, excited about him. Um, you know, anytime you get a big time D lineman out of Georgia, it always turns out well. I mean, he's like, but again, like kids like this, when they're, when they're playing against like the worst competition in the entire world, um, you just wonder how they're going to handle Ohio six. I've seen guys that, their film looks really good. Again, I was talking about Curtis Grant. Curtis Grant's film was amazing. And he played against the worst competition in all of Virginia. But like, look, look, look at these kids. Jesus Christ. You know. But he's, like I said, he's twitchy, which is good. I mean, you can evaluate the twitch on the film, uh, which is really, really important. All right. Let's uh, get a couple of super chats knocked out while this film is running. Tim Z, is there a connection between the Connor Stein scandal and the Western uh, Michigan DC hire to Michigan? I highly, highly doubt it. Um, there might be some connect. They might have met before, but you know, um, Sean Moore is not going to just hire some guy because he knows Connor. Uh, he probably hire. He probably not hire people because they know Connor. Um, but I don't think there's any connection. Nevada. Uh, Tim Z asks, is there a connection between Connor Sarens and his scandal in the Western Michigan DC hire uh, to Michigan? I doubt that. Yeah, well, I think the, the I mean, the scandal, I mean, I, it's hard to keep track of all the scandals with Michigan. Somebody put up a scandal bracket with Michigan today, which was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It, it was listing all the scandals and kind of a uh, NCAA tournament format and uh it, it's hard to keep track of them there's so many but i believe it was central michigan when when when, when stallions was doing the sunglasses with at night with the spy thing that was central michigan and so i'm not sure that, you know if that's what we're talking about with connection to western michigan but no um i think this is just this is sharon moore going out and just assembling another member of the dream team. This is dream team number two because dream team number one, the guy got his third drunk driving thing and he had to go off the dream team. So now this is the new dream team member who's going to lead them to uh, college football greatness. Um, but I don't think it has anything to do with stallions. Um, and, uh, and I still want to, I, I, I still want to hear when this NCAA report drops, I want to read the, the chapter about the Central Michigan thing is going to be just comedy gold because I want to read what they're saying about that, how he got on the field, whose head's going to roll, which poor intern are they going to waterboard and blame for having him on the sidelines dressed like a coach and nobody else noticed the phony coach on the sideline uh, wearing sunglasses at night as if that wasn't the biggest uh, the biggest. I mean, if you see anybody wearing sunglasses at night, don't you just kind of notice them naturally? In any setting, especially, and, and if they're dressed like a coach, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I, I like I said, I, I'm waiting for that to come. It's going to be glorious, and uh, hopefully we'll all read along and just have a big chuckle about it. Your buddy on the screen right there, there he is, sunglasses at night in September. So it's not like the sun, it's not like it's winter and the sun's going down early. There's your boy, national television arms crossed uh his a little uh sideline credential is flipped over so you can't see the name on it but there's your boy <laughs> sunglasses at night in seven you know it's like probably 8 30 in the summer september so the sun is even down um and uh yeah they, they and they've never said a word about that since all this broke so that was uh 
that was one of the finest moments in college football history just because it was so it was so obvious he was there. It was a Friday night game. You know, Michigan had team dinner and then they had a noon game versus some hapless opponent the next day. But he's like, well, I want to ride up the road to Lansing, which is, you know, like an hour from Ann Arbor or whatever it is, and sneak into the game and be like, oh, well, we don't know how he could have gotten down the, down there and he went rogue. And I'm like, well, he clearly, somebody clearly gave him their sideline pass. You know I mean? It's not really that hard to figure it out. But yeah, the, uh, the Keystone cops never got to the bottom of that one, did they, Nevada? Not yet, but it's uh, it's that day is coming, man. That day is coming. I cannot wait, Ben G. Thank you for being an ultra member. Thank you for the ten. Nevada slash Kirk is the new emphasis on D line at rotation from better depth or a lesson learned the hard way by Ryan Day. What was holding this back before? Well, that is a great question. I think that, um. Honestly, I'm not going to cop out, but I feel like it is a combination of both. I think that Ryan probably learned a lesson, uh, especially later in the season, because like Jack and JT got stronger down the stretch, but it wasn't because they were fresh. It was just because they took the chains off and let them actually pass rush a little bit. But, you know, there's a point in life where you just have to trust other people to do the job other than just the known entities, the known quantities. And, uh, you know, they didn't trust Kenyatta. They didn't trust Caden Curry, like point blank, period. Um, and the year before, and, and again, as much as I bang on Tony Alford for his rotation, like Larry Johnson's rotations have been atrocious too because Larry played Jerron Cage and played, uh, you know, uh, Teron Vincent, who both were trash. They're terrible. Nice kids. Very good players. I'm sure they're great modern citizens for Ohio State Nation. But in terms of players, like, Tyleek and uh, Mike Hall sat on the bench. They're sophomore years for those two guys. And again, I'm not being a hater, but if you're not on an NFL roster as a rookie or even on a practice squad, then it means Kirk's right, which again, I was right on that. I said they should be playing Tyleek and Mike and not these two guys because Larry shows a lot of loyalty to older players, even if they stink uh, and they're not productive. So again, uh, he wants the guys to get to the league. It's the same like every coach wants their seniors to get to the league, but you got to play your best players. But I think like with Ryan, you know, I'm going to go back to trust like Jim Trussell and then back in the way, the time machine, the way back machine, you know, five going into that Texas game. We play, or excuse me, or six. We went down to Austin where it was 105 degrees. He told our second team line, the third drive of the game, you guys are going into the game. So this doesn't matter if we're down by 20 points, if we're up by 20 points, uh, whatever. And we had a situation where, you know, we had two drives. Texas looked really good. I mean, I I wasn't sure when we, the, first, the game started. We did not start off really that hot. And Donald Washington got a turnover. He's running the other way on the big, on the, they had the, they call it the Godzilla Tron. They had the biggest Jumbo Tron in the world at the time. And they're running back the other way. And we're all excited to be in, TJ Downing and Dadish and Alex Boone and the first team line is all excited to go back in the game and they're like, oh no, no, no. Trust, trust and Jim Bullman. We're like, nope, we are going to stick to the, th the third series where we're putting the twos in. And I'm like, I, I think we might have been losing. I think we might have been down seven nothing or whatever. And we just got a turnover where they brought it to the other side of the field. I'm like, you're seriously gonna play a bunch of guys who've never played before versus the number one team in the country on the road when we have plus field position, you're sick. Yep. And, and just did it. And I'll be damned. They went down and scored. And again, the plays that Jim Bowman called, because again, Jim Bowman knew those guys couldn't block any of you. If I put four of you, four random Buckeye scoop podcasters in on the D line, you guys probably could have beat some of those guys that were playing on that other line. He called like nakeds and misdirections and stuff where literally the offensive line didn't have to block anybody. And we watched it on film and it was like literally none of them had to block anybody. And magically we went down and scored. And I was like, I'll be damned. It worked. Trust is a genius. People still remember that to this day. So, you know, again, I know Trust has been loitering around the facility and uh, giving uh, some insights around day, but I thought that was a profound moment where he had a belief uh, he had to believe in guys that frankly, like didn't give him a lot of reason to believe in him, And he did. 
and they scored, and the rest is history. And again, that that could be Kenyatta, that could be Caden Curry. Because I've said like I've said a thousand times, like the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life is the fact that those guys had to play the entire game versus Notre Dame. And I mean, I've never seen two DNs and and I study Ohio State football as much as any human being on earth. I've never seen two DNs play the entire game ever. Especially in recent history, the last twenty years where we've had depth, we've rotated guys, uh, because you have to. Like, I mean, Miles Garrett rotates in and out, TJ Watt rotates in and out, Nick Bosa, Joey Bosa. You go watch the NFL game. None of those guys play every single snap because they can't. It's hard. Uh, you got to run to the ball. It's exhausting. So, but for some reason against Notre Dame, our ends, Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson, weren't good enough to give Larry Johnson enough confidence to put them in when we needed them the most. So, Jack and JT had to be Iron Man. But uh, I think it'll be very interesting. Nevada, uh, the new emphasis on D line rotation uh, from, you know, is that from a better depth or less learned the hard way by Ryan Day? And what was holding that back before? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely believe that that was a Ryan Day directive. I've been told that was a Ryan Day directive because, look, it went across players and positions. I mean, it wasn't just the defensive line that did that. It's a, I liken it to, like, hockey. And if any of you guys are hockey fans, you guys know I'm a hockey guy. And, you know, you get the big game, and all of a sudden – you shorten the bench <laughs> and, and now you're not rolling four lines. And sometimes you're not even allowed rolling three lines. You might just roll your two lines and you're going with your best players. And I just think that Ryan day didn't trust the backups and just told the coaches that he wanted them to play the best players. And so it, I think your answer was the, was the right one, which was, it was a combination of things. I think it is a lesson learned. Um, because he didn't trust the guys. He didn't trust the depth. And now, what has Ohio State been doing this year? They've been assembling depth. They've been assembling guys upon guys upon guys. And I think they're in a much better position to do it. And I think Ryan realized that, especially with a season like this, that you've got to play the guys. So I would expect all the rotations across the board um, to change because I, I think Ryan did learn his lesson, did you know realize that that was suboptimal going about it that way. And, um, and we have, this is the deepest Ohio State team I've ever seen. And that, the, the, I forget, I, the 2015 team I know is great. We can talk about all the great teams. But this team is the deepest team I've ever seen. And that, you know, normally you're going into a season and you're, you're, you're in great shape, but there's always that question, well, you know, we're in great shape, but if Justin Fields goes down, we're completely screwed. Or, you know, if this guy goes down, we really don't have a capable backup. And you can go across the thing in Ohio State, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a position where we don't have a pair and a spare. And um, that's really, you know, a great spot to be in, you know, considering how difficult the schedule is going to be. Um, so, yeah, I think Ryan has learned his lesson, has stated that much to the players, and they're making a concerted effort to, to rotate more during the spring and have the guys ready to rotate more in the fall. So I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, when you're facing as long of a season as it's going to be, like, you got to get some of these guys in. Plus, like, some of these guys want to play. I mean, I mean, Caden and Kenyatta are not young. They're juniors now. I mean, they're the same age as Jack and JT were last year. And it's like, nobody thought those guys were young because they'd been playing since they were freshmen, like a significant moment. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they get all these guys this year. Adam Dare, thanks for the 10. Happy Friday. You spoke a couple weeks ago about James Peoples having issues with his NIL. Has that been handled? To my knowledge, no. Uh, any whispers of people's went to, to follow Alford? Excuse me. Uh, do not know that one. Nevada OH. I O. Um, yeah, I I don't know if his uh, NIL has been resolved, but I know when he got here it was not. Um, so, again, that's part of the, the issues with some of the stuff is sometimes kids – get promised stuff and doesn't get delivered. Some collectives run out of money. Uh, I know that he's got a car. He's got a really nice car. Um, but I don't know. Um, in terms of whispers of uh, people starting to follow uh, Tony Alford, I mean, you know, there's probably a part of you when you look around that, you know, when the guy that you love is, you know, your position coach and he takes off and goes elsewhere, like, and, and, and that's actually like their depth chart is cleaner. Um, would you think about it for a second? Sure. But is it, is it worth going up there when they're going to be terrible this year? I don't think so. Um, 
I don't know. Uh, but it'll be interesting. I, I still think, you know, regardless of getting this kid from UMass, like James Peoples is a way better player than that kid. And so is uh, uh, Dallin Hayden. I mean, because again, this kid that we're taking from UMass, like it makes no sense he's transferring here because he played at UMass and, you know, he wasn't a huge recruit coming out of high school. So it's not like he, it's not like he's coming from USC or Texas or Oklahoma. He's like, he's coming from UMass. So, I mean, it's not, it, it's really bizarre if that all goes down. Um, and I would take James Peoples over that kid any day of the week, but this is my opinion. Uh, Nevada, um, we spoke a few weeks ago about James Peoples having issues with his NIL. Um, has this been handled? Any whispers of Peoples wanting to follow Alfred? Or I guess you could say, or hit the portal in general. Um, again, I don't know on the portal part. Again, you know, when you look at the depth chart, when you've got Trey and you've got Quinshawn ahead of you, they're both gone after this year, no matter what. You know, it's you and Dallin at that point, and uh, it's go time after that. But uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, to my knowledge, I know that the collectives are aware of the situation with James Peebles. I don't know if it's been fulfilled. It would be weird given that they're aware, and we're not talking about tons of money. So um, this should be handled. As you said, he got a car, but I, I believe that was handled outside of the collective. I don't think it was handled through the collective. I think it was handled through another agent. Um, but he did get a car type of situation set up with them. Um, as for the whispers, um, he's the one guy that I – I won't say worried is the wrong word, but it's the one guy that I'm keeping an eye on um, because I think it's, it's, I think it's definitely in play. I think they've got to get that running back coach set up, which, you know, we're all hearing that that's supposed to go down. So it's be announced any day now, literally any day now. So I, I would hope they could keep James Peoples. I like James Peoples a lot, but um, I'd say my concern level on a scale of 10 is probably a four right now. And I reserve the right to change my mind being to move that up or down based upon new information, but the NIL stuff, I know they're aware of it. I know they, they're aware of how much money now. Every, every, you understand it. When it happened, that was handed by his position coach. It was handled by Alford and the collectives are claiming, Oh, he didn't communicate that with us. So it's kind of, everybody's pointing the fingers at everybody. Well, you didn't do it. Well, you didn't do it with this guy dropped the ball. Well, he didn't tell us. So I would imagine if this is a kid they want to keep that they'll get this thing figured out because we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about tons of money here. Um, they could do this. This, you know, it 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 wouldn't break the collectives to uh, you know honor this commitment. They just they just gotta have the the want and the desire to do so. Yeah, I mean, Tony was very sloppy with the nil stuff, and I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm glad he's gone. I know I know too much about what Tony was doing, and it was uh it, it wasn't it wasn't good it was actually uh impossibly stupid and it's amazing that he didn't get into trouble while he was here doing it so i'll leave it at that but um yeah i know too much about tony so thank god he's gone uh chocolate chip scucci thank you for the 10 this year i truly believe we will see a vast difference in, in game management from ryan day being a real head coach now too bad the attention will be on the transfers we got oc football will be unrecognizable um I'll let you, uh, I think I'll let you go first on this one, Nevada. Uh, again, chocolate chips, Gucci. Thanks for the ten. Uh, he believes that uh, he he will truly see a vast difference in game management from Ryan Day being real head coach. Too bad the attention will be on our transfers. Uh, OSU football will be unrecognizable. Do you agree? Disagree? Uh, if so, uh, why? In your opinion? Well, look, do I think we'll t there's obviously a lot to unwind there. The first part, will Ryan be better off as a game manager? No question. No question. And we've had some really questionable clock management things, some questionable decisions on down at distance, some questionable decisions on when to go for it, when to kick, when to go settle for a field goal. You know, I think he'll be better at all that stuff. And that's just going to benefit Ohio State. And having Chip Kelly there to, to do the offense – Unbelievable. I think it's just, you know, the, the combination of the best passing game coordinator and the best running game coordinator in college football on the same staff is uh, really rare air, something very, very special. Uh, as a fan, I just encourage you to enjoy every moment of it because however long it lasts, it won't be long enough. And uh, these things never last forever. So I'm going to I'm gonna enjoy every snap, every possession, every game, watching these two maestros work out there with this Ohio State team. 
As for the second thing about Ohio State football, didn't exactly understand the question about the, the transfers and Ohio State football. All I say is college football is going through some profound changes right now. You know, we've talked about the Big Ten champion, the elimination of conferences, and the Big Ten championship game being a one-two, and the expanded playoff, and the transfer portal, and NIL, and the the uh, the, the expansion. Um, so everything's changed. But as a fan, I'm just kind of sitting back and kind of enjoying it. And, you know, for every bad thing that comes with the change, I just look for the good. And, you know, expansion, bad. Hey, I get to see USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington more often. That, that, that's good. Uh, NIL, bad. Hey, we get to keep players longer that may have gone on to the NFL draft. And, you know, that's, that's certainly a net positive. Um, expanded playoff. Hey, more quality football games for Ohio State, this great team. And heaven forbid we slip up at the beginning of the year and lose one. The season's not over because we lost one game by three points at Iowa City or something like that. So I'm just looking for the good, but it, it's going to be different. But I, I think that it's a net positive. And as an Ohio State fan, as, as, a, as a team, as part of the haves as opposed to the have-nots, everything that we've just talked about breaks in favor of Ohio State, expanding coaching staffs. NIL expanded playoff. So, it, you know, if, if we've been in the golden era of Ohio State football, we're about to go into the platinum era of Ohio State football, where we take over the throne from Alabama and start running off some championships. And I, and I really truly believe that, and, uh, and and I'm excited for it. Yeah, I I think um, you know a vast difference in game management for Ryan Day. Yeah, because I think he's been terrible at it uh, again. And I I really like Ryan. I think he does a good job. I think he's learning on the job, but. He has had a lot of help, and a lot of that is his doing because he hired guys and uh, promoted guys that, frankly, shouldn't have been coaching at Ohio State. So he's rectified almost all of those except for one. Excuse me. And uh, I thought they missed Kevin Wilson last year, and it showed. But uh, I, I think now that he's got Chip on the offensive side, Jim Knowles on the defensive side, he's got two adults running the show on each side. So he can be a real hot coach. And I think it's going to show uh, – He's going to pay big dividends just because of how he manages the games, how he uses timeouts, how um, he doesn't have to run like the entire offense like he's had to the last few years where um, he gets frustrated, he gets angry because I think there's sometimes when he was in game where he felt like he had no hope. And uh, he, it showed on the sideline where he'd get just ultra frustrated with uh, the lack of production from some players on offense. And, you know, it, it really... Uh, it would show in ugly, ugly forms uh, sometimes. But I also think, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of attention on the transfers we got, but I don't think it's any different than, you know, again, you look at a lot of sports teams, you know, in the past few years, past 15 years, you know, it's like when uh, a coach guides a team to a championship in the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, there's always some big free agent signings. There's always like some big trade that gets made, um, you know, like the Miami Heat, obviously, you know, they, when they when they signed LeBron, got a uh, they got a championship in year two. Um, you know, when you when you do some big deal or the the Warriors trade for Kevin Durant, you know, I think that you still got to give the coach his just due because you still got to coach those guys, even if it's you know an overwhelming talent advantage, you still got to coach them. Um, and I think that Ryan, you know, if he gets through the the, the deal, like I mean, like when Nick Saban won all his national championships, he won like seven titles. Um, and like six were at Alabama, like how many of those did he not have the most talented team in the country? You know, so a lot of it is about collecting talent um, and getting it to all play together. Because again, it's it's not just getting all the guys on uh, uh, in the same jerseys. Like you get them get them to play together, buy into the system, not be cancerous. You got to deal with idiot. Like you have to deal with parents that are just total idiots, uh, um, agents uncles like it's it's a big deal when you add more people to the pot um and it's never been harder than now with the nil the nil there's some kids that are getting major money some guys aren't getting anything so i mean you got to manage all that and it's it's just the same thing as the nfl at this point but um i think ryan's done a good job of it i think the team's excited um again i i love the nil, the NIL. like if i could have played back in the day and we could have signed caleb downs like i wouldn't have cared what you would have had to pay him. like if we could have gotten some of the the good DBs in the country and we had great defensive backs in 06, like I would have been all for it. If we could have gotten the monster D end in 06, I'd have been all for it. But uh that was just something that was um that wasn't available obviously back then. 
D Sunny, thank you for the five. Can you talk a little bit about elite play callers? Um, hang on one second. Are they constantly setting plays up through the game? Sometimes even calling a loser play purposely. That's interesting because I, I'm sure you probably saw the thing where Kyle Shanahan does that, where he'll call a play that he knows is going to get stopped. He knows how it's going to get stopped. It kind of puts the the defense at ease because they they see some action or whatever, and they stop a play and they get some confidence, and they run the same action, and then he runs something off of it. Um, I never really heard of that. Like we've never really called a play at Ohio State where it was like, hey. I'm going to call this play. It's going to get stopped. But the play that we're going to call, you know, a quarter later off of it is going to be a touchdown. That is kind of wild. But I know Kyle Shanahan, he literally said he does that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I think that elite play callers are, they're not just elite play callers. They have elite people around them that can recognize what the other team is doing. And this is on offense or defense. Uh, yeah, because Jim Knowles is, uh, fantastic at calling a game i think chip kelly is fantastic at calling a game tom herman was fantastic at calling a game but you gotta have good players around you you gotta have good people that can recognize what's going on tell you what's going on accuracy is critical and it has to be uh done fast like this is like being um i, I like I, I don't i don't like to do the war analogies because because i don't think it's respectful but like you know like if you're like a spotter for like a sniper i mean you, you got to be accurate you got to be like literally deadly accurate that's kind of what it's like when you're calling out what's going on on defense like you can't miss on that you can't say oh it's cover three and really it's cover one or you can't say it's like it's this uh you know blitzes are pretty easy to identify. you can't really screw up a blitz but you can't if you screw up coverages and that type of thing like it can get you into a lot of trouble um if you if you misread what especially like what corners are doing if they're if they're dropping to a zone, if they're backpulling, if they're man up, I mean, there's, you know, you got to make sure you're on point with that. So I, um, I think it's really about having a good team and having guys that can react to that. Um, and, and guys that can, uh, predict what they're going to get. And again, the, the predicting what you're going to get is, is the most difficult part to the whole equation. Because like I said, I've, I've said it, if you guys have been on the show, like in 2012, when we were getting ready to play teams, you know, we were running Urban Meyer's power spread offense that he had from Florida, and we never had any idea what we were going to get because it was a totally new offense to the Big Ten. And every single week that we tried to project what we were going to get, we were dead wrong. Like, we weren't even close. So um, it was almost hilarious how bad we were at doing that um, to the point where, like, the offensive linemen, when I say this is what we're going to get, they wouldn't even believe me mm -hmm. about, like, week eight because, you know, we were so bad at predicting it. Which, again, you can't predict something when – you're going against guys that have never seen this offense and you have no idea how they're going to defend it. But, um, you know, once you got into the game, uh, it makes it even more important to have an elite play caller and a, and a, and a team of guys that can figure out what we're going to get because then you can adjust to it and pick it apart, which is what we did. Um, Nevada, the question is uh, from D Sunny. And again, thank you for the five D Sunny. Again, you bring the best questions. I appreciate you, my man. Can you talk a little bit about elite play callers? Um, and in your opinion, are they constantly setting up plays throughout the game? Sometimes even calling a loser play purposely, which is that's what Kyle Shanahan does. Like again, that's that's the difference. I know, like when I worked with Urban and Tom and Jim, like we never called a play and said, "Hey, this play is gonna suck. Brace yourself, everybody." Um, but the play we're gonna call next quarter is gonna be a touchdown. We never did that. But um, your thoughts on that, Nevada? Well, that, that kind of reminds me, like, when I played backyard football when I was growing up, we'd, we'd run a play where we'd run, like, an out pattern and just throw the ball purposely too wide, and then next play, run the same out pattern, then pump fake it and have the guy jump on it and have the guy run past him or something like that. That that always worked in my backyard there in Aukum, Germany. Um, but I think in, in big-time football, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think they waste too many plays in terms of doing, like you said, sometimes they talk about that stuff with the guys, but... I want to talk about this question in the context of Ryan Day last year versus Ryan Day this year, because Ryan Day last year was the play caller and the head football coach and on the headset with the defense and, you know, doing everything that had to you know, involve, you know, calling plays. And, you know, what happens when people call plays is 
they become predictable. They become predictable because invariably, as much as you try to st- you know, stay unpredictable and stay out of your patterns, people naturally fall into patterns. That's just human nature. Um, you know, they talked about it. You know, there was a, a great post. I think it was helping technician had put something on there about how code code breakers could even tell by somebody here by listening to their Morse code how they tapped it, which person was doing that because they just have a certain rhythm, a certain cadence. And I, I think that Ryan falls in a certain cadence, and that's why we'd end up with too many loser plays because he does he he becomes predictable. And I I contrast that to this year where it's like you're going to have Chip Kelly. Who again, Chip Kelly for the past ten years or twelve years has been in Ryan Day's shoes. He's been calling plays, but doing it for the sideline and doing it while managing everything else that's going on. And now Chip's just going to be able to be solely focused on the offense. What's the next plays? What are the what's the defense doing? How can I best attack them? And I just think that I think the the difference is going to be night and day between what we've been getting the last few years with Ryan trying to handle all the responsibilities and be in the play call. I know guys do it at the NFL level. I know there's, there's people that do it at the college level. I just think that it's, it's impossibly difficult to do it. And if you can get a savant, uh, a guy in the pantheon of great offensive play callers to call the plays for you, and you're still there to kind of give them support and guidance and thoughts and suggestions, I, I think the OSU offense in 2024 is going to be absolutely special. Way, way less loser plays way less predictability, and um, I, I can't wait to see it. I'm, I, I think we're really in for a treat. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. I'm really excited about it. I think these guys uh, these guys are gassed up. Here we go. Uh, chocolate chips, Scoochie, thanks for the deuce. Uh, this is a follow-up to the previous question where you mentioned that you thought too bad the attention will be on the transfers that Ohio State got. Uh, you it is your belief that the outsiders will say uh, the reason Ohio State is good is because of the transfers. Um, I don't really care. I mean, honestly, like again, the rosters are going to be the rosters are all fluid now. I mean, you're going to change out thirty percent of your roster every year. Uh, you're going to get better players. You're going to get dismiss the 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 weaker, the lesser players. Um, and that's just part of the game now. And again, I'm not I'm not mad about it. I mean, when we had you know, uh, a, a weak quarterback room and we're not got Justin Fields, like, guess what? Like, that's part of the game. If you can exploit that and enhance your roster, you do it. And, yeah, we we thought Cal McCord wasn't good. We're not got Will Howard. I uh, got uh, – weren't sure on Aaron Nolan. Again, I, I'm i convinced with Aaron Nolan. Like, you know, they weren't in on Julian Sane until – you know, Aaron Air, Air, Air had a very rough start to his career at Ohio State. So I'm just leaving it at that. But – all of a sudden, when there's an opening to get Julian saying, like, like you know, we're not sure on this kid, so they went out and got Julian saying, and they did, and uh, it might be the best move they've ever made. So I think, uh, you know, again, Air kind of dug his own grave, um, and he's got to dig himself out. Now, he's still competing with Julian, and he's still on the roster, and he's still uh, a freshman, and he's got a lot of time to grow and, and compete. But, you know, there was a time where they were totally in bed with Air, and it, he was the guy, and uh, he just didn't start off real hot. And again, at Ohio State – I swear to God, I've been a coach. I've been a player. You don't want to give these coaches a reason. If you give them a reason uh, to to think that something's up with you or they got to replace you, then they're going to. You know, if they can upgrade their circumstances or situation again, um, and that doesn't that doesn't just involve transfer portal recruiting. It involves their life. You know, like I mean, Tony Alford's like, well, Michigan is a better situation than Ohio State. So these coaches are as faithful as their options. So if you don't learn anything else from this show. Just write that on your forehead and say, when when these coaches leave, when they take off, when they go to Indiana or Michigan or the NFL or whatever, say, man, Kirk was right. Because again, I'm usually right about stuff like this, and I because I've lived it, I've seen it. Um, those guys want to move up in the world. They want security. They want to get paid. They want to take care of their families. They don't care about the kids, you know. So, and that's not just exclusive to Ohio State. That's any coach in the profession. So, um, you know, again, like if you're, you know, a quarterback's coach, if you're Bill O'Brien and you're there and Aaron Owens screwing up left and right, then, you know, if Julian saying all of a sudden is in the portal because Nick Saban takes off, then give him a call. And all of a sudden he wants to show up and all of a sudden he's available, then you take him, you know, and then Bill obviously did what was best for his family. And he went back to Boston and he took the BC job and 
he was here for three weeks or whatever. So Chip Kelly comes along and, you know, these guys want to do what's best for, uh, to, to keep them employed and, and to win championships and do what's best for their job security. And, you know, if you're a player and you're screwing up, then kind of is what it is at that point. But I, um, I honestly couldn't be more excited than I'm for joint six. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Nevada, uh, chocolate chip Scucci, uh, was doing a follow up where he said too bad. The attention will be on the transfers. We got assuming we win. Um, and that, uh, he believes the outsiders will say the reason we won is because of the transfers, which it easily could be. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, let's, let's get it all out right now. Okay. The only reason we win is because we cheat. The only reason we win is we're bought, not built. The only way we win is because we went out and stole players from other teams. I don't care. You know, like Ohio State, no matter what, nobody's ever going to give Ohio State its due when we win the national championship. So just accept the fact that haters are going to hate. They're never going to be happy for you as an Ohio State fan. They're never going to just tip their cap to you and go, you know, I just really want to salute your program because you guys were just better than us and you guys did it the right way and you won the national championship honorably and I salute you, Ohio State fan. You're, you're never going to get that. So once you kind of accept that fact that you're never going to get that kind of affirmation from the other fans, screw those guys. I don't care. I, I, none of them, I don't care anybody's opinion about Ohio State. Um, did we go out? We, we've gone by the rules. The rules are you can go out and get players now. So you know what? We're going out and getting players. And I, I love it. And if we were sitting here doing some gentleman's agreement. We're like the last team. We're going, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to honor the commitments and not go out and get players. Where would we be? We'd, we'd be way behind the curve. And, and as a fan, you'd be sitting there, you know, screaming, why isn't Ohio state responding to the changing landscape of college football? And you'd be right to say that. So no, I don't care. We're doing it the right way. Ohio state's being aggressive um, in the portal, aggressive with NIL, and aggressive in terms of roster management, and that's what it takes to be a, a you know, to, to be a champion in 2024. And uh, I I love it. So let them cry. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of like this portal era, the roster processing, the going out and getting better players. It reminds me of Urban Meyer, like because Urban Meyer, you know, he's at Florida, changed everything about recruiting. Like there used to be this old unspoken hunky dory old fashioned gentleman's agreement where you know if if team nevada buck has a really good player committed team kirk is gonna not call him leave him be gentleman's agreement handshake thing jig and urban was like screw that dude i'm gonna i'm gonna recruit him until until he signs that piece of paper and i'm not i'm legally Urban's like, I'm going to recruit him until I'm legally no longer allowed to call him, which is when he sends the letter of intent. So, you know, when, when Urban, that was the best, like when Urban came up to the Big Ten, man, it was like, it was like everybody had these old fashioned rules where it was like, oh, well, we don't recruit people that are recruited and we don't, uh, we don't want to ruffle feathers and we want everybody to once a kid recruits that everybody can kind of chill out and take it easy and relax. And Irvin was like, he was like, F that noise, boy, we're coming. We're coming after Taylor Decker and Kyle Dodson and Savon Pittman, who was committed to Michigan state. And <laughs> we flipped everybody because they weren't ready for it. Because again, like in this game, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a, you know, either we win or you win, you know, like we can't split. It's not like a, in the Bible where you can just cut Taylor Decker in half and Notre Dame gets half of them and we get half of them. It's like, no, like either we get them or you did. So we jacked him, Jack Savon Pittman. Uh, and again, it was no holds barred, nasty, dirty. And that's why urban dominated the big 10 because they had to catch up to that. They had to get cut. They had to, you know, the big 10 was old fashioned, hunky dory, golly gee whiz recruiting. Uh, congrats on getting that kid we won't call him ever again urban was calling him every day so you know that's kind of what the portal's like i mean the portal is you know it's it's what you know uh blowing up gentlemen's agreements was 10 years ago and he's ultra aggressive or, you know, ryan's aggressive chip kelly you know the staff is aggressive because you know i mean if there's a great player out there and he has an interest to play at ohio state then 
come on. You know, again, these teams, a lot of these kids in their formative years were growing up in the super team era. They, they saw LeBron James, who is the art. He is the athlete of their generation, the greatest athlete of their generation, because they were too young to see Jordan. Who's way better than LeBron. Um, they saw him jump in with Bosch and Wade. So a lot of these kids, they see that and they're just like, Ooh, how can I make my life a lot easier? Don't stay in Cleveland. Like, let's go join up with Bosch and Wade and play in Miami and make it a make it a place where it's easy for guys to to sign as free agents and a place where people want to live. And let's make it easy. Like, coming to Ohio State is easy because, like, we've got this humongous track record of sending guys to the NFL. Uh, we've got massive talent on our team. It gets bigger every year. It gets better every year. We've got a great culture, um, which I think a lot of it starts in the wide receiver room where uh, the guys, they see the writing on the wall. It's a selfless deal where these guys will wait two, three years before they become big time players. And uh, then they kind of take off from there. And, and if they're good, they turn into first round picks, you know, and if, and they can still make rosters even as late round picks uh, like Noah Brown did. So I think it's uh it's just a new era of recruiting and, and college football. And I think Ohio state's been really good at it. And again, like with our NIL being really strong with Ryan day, you know, really getting to the portal um, really the only thing that we've missed on is we haven't really hit, uh, we haven't hit on a lot of these portal O linemen, but I think that some of it is because of proximity, you know, like Jared Kingston's a kid that went to SC from Washington state, but he was from California and he picked USC over us. So it's like, sometimes I feel like we get punished on the O line just because a lot of these kids, they like to stay close to home, but it's always interesting to see, uh, if we can, uh, flip guys and get them get him here because like for some of these kids like josh simmons who i think who's i think is a really good player um you know these guys are starting to look at their opportunities especially with nil and having some some travel money in their pocket uh it's a business decision it's kind of like going away to an ivy league school like you're gonna get a great education but you can't drive home every weekend like you could if you stayed um like in the state of ohio or whatever so uh it'll be fascinating to see how this continues to develop well, Nevada, um, got about an hour. Uh, we wrap this thing up. Any final thoughts as we get into uh, what should be a good weekend? They got student appreciation day. Uh, they got some really good stuff uh, going tomorrow. Um, appreciate Devin and Kim for whacking some weasels in our chat. Appreciate you guys as always. Uh, now, now I, I'm seeing a super chat from Donald and Karen Rossbach. Did you miss one there? Uh, did that just pop? Yeah, sorry, Darren. Or excuse me, guys. Actually, you know, I've got a. Uh... Ooh, I've got three. Oh, I apologize, <laughs> guys. Well I, well, I was looking at a regular chat, so I could either have the super chats or the, the other chat. So we actually have four chats, so I apologize. We're not wrapping this up. We got about another hot minute. David Crow, thank you for the 20 and thanks for being an ultra member. Haven't heard much about Will Howard and how he's progressing. Um, he's doing fantastic, actually. Uh, he is a big horse, a big monster. Super excited about that. <clears throat> And the updates about the offensive line, how they're looking as opposed to last year. Keep up the good work, and thanks for keeping us informed. Nevada OH. I O. Yeah, I apologize. We got five super chats now, so appreciate you guys. Um, the line is way better, and this is according to people that are at practice every day watching. Um, this isn't just me uh, pontificating or looking at a Ouija board. People are saying these guys much better. And again, I knew these guys would get better because when you get four out of five guys back. Um, they're going to be way better. And then you add Seth McLaughlin. You got Carson, who's a year older. Jimmy you know, wasn't even here for spring last year. He's got a year in, in, in the weight room with Mick. Like, our line is going to be absolutely awesome. Really excited about it. Um, and Will Howard is going to be, in all likelihood, our starter. Um, he, uh, this guy that Ryan Day went out and handpicked. Chip Kelly loves him. So, I think it's going to be a, this is going to be a really fun offense to watch. Uh, Nevada, David Crow asks, uh, he says he hasn't heard much about Will Howard and how he's progressing and also wants any updates on the line. Uh, do you have anything to add to my initial pontifications? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to say, if you like the, the, if you like our show on YouTube, which first of all, thank you guys so much for, for the compliments, consider becoming a member at BuckeyeScoop.com. This is what we do the other 23 hours a day when we're not here on this YouTube channel. We answer questions like this. We get it. We have some great nuggets, some really detailed nuggets, break down almost every position group on the field. 
Um, let me tell you, Will Howard's doing terrific. Will, like, you know, as Kirk said, Will Howard's having, you know, a, a, a great winter, great spring, um, team leader already, uh, throws a good ball, puts it in, you know, in good spots. And the best thing, and I, I, some people might not like this, some people might like this, he is a willing runner, a very willing runner. Likes eyes bright up when they when they call his number to run the ball. Loves to run the football. Um, I, I, he's got some Josh Allen in him from that standpoint, who loves when his number's called. And um, I think he's going to make just a, you know, a tremendous change for the uh, for the OSU offense. The offensive line. I talked to the defensive players and asked them. They're like, Wait, the offensive line is way better than it was last year. Way. So that's coming from the defensive guys. So it's not just, you know, happy thoughts or smiley things. Um, I think part of that's the, just the benefit of having a, a full year in the system. There's nothing like starts, nothing like returning experience. And the Chip Kelly offense is just putting them in much, much, much better spots. And just as a point, you know, the, we don't just say that of every group. I, I've said on the on Buckeyescoop.com, but I think the tight end group, is not where it needs to be. So it's not like we're just sitting there going, oh, every group's great. Every group is fantastic. Everything, Everything's better than last year. I think tight ends, we've got some work to do. And, and uh, I, I, I think, you know, we've had some ads. We've had some guys returning, but uh, they're not where we want them to be just yet. Uh, but offensive line, quarterback, very, very good shape and uh, poised for a big, huge 2024. And, and I think it's going to be Will Howard who's going to be leading us. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm excited for uh, for what we're going to get. And that tight end room needs to get a lot better. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, Jeremy Moreland, thank you for the five. Best mot- motel near Buffalo Wild Wings for the meetup. No drinking, driving, and want to hit Hyde Park Sunday. Thanks. Uh, if you're sitting down by Hyde Park, I'd look at Moxie uh, and the Hiltons that are downtown. Um, the Hiltons downtown are a really quick little walk from Hyde Park. So... If you want to Uber um, from down there, uh, I'd say the Hilton downtown. Uh, the Blackwell is the meta. The Blackwell is by far the best option. So you can see if by some miracle there are rooms available for the Blackwell. Um, that's number one. The Hiltons are number two for me. Uh, shouldn't be too crazy, I don't think. Moxie is a great hotel. It's kind of short uh, short north-ish, um, but it's above Town Hall. Good spot. So... Those are my suggestions, but I think if you can get Blackwell, that's the meta by far, Jeremy. So uh, I would look at that. Looking forward to seeing you on the 13th. And I also have my Nevada Buck Cup right here, as always, oh, with ooh. the correct C and the Buckeye oh, Scoop. Nice. He sent me two of them. Uh, so I, I uh, have got to get one to Nevada. As soon as he decides to come to Ohio, he's going to get a cup. So I got to make him oh. fly out here to get his cup. Oh. So Very Michigan nice. game, it'll be in the suite for your cocoa. Oh. I know that you're going to have a good time squeezing at least 30 people into your suite for that <laughs> Michigan game and having a great having a great time. So all of you guys, you guys go to the right suite and say, hey, I'm here for a Nevada buck. Just walk right in there and make yourself at home. <laughs> kick your, kick oh, your feet God. up and have oh, a great, God. great time. Oh, and say, and tell, and tell them Nevada Buck requested my presence. Um, Kirk, Kirk, Kirk. No, I know. Because <laughs> Kirk will be at home on the couch. I can't wait. Kirk is, be, uh, Kirk is being <laughs> naughty. He's being Kirk, naughty. Kirk is, I am Antifa throwing the Molotov cocktail. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Adam, thank you for the five. Kirk, can I send you my police department patch? I love that. Uh, email it to me, barton.145 at gmail.com. I will try to get cropped and thrown onto our uh, our badge deal. Now, this has to be inside of BuckeyeScoop.com. Um, cannot do this on this, but I'll try to do the best I can. Thanks for your support. Also, do you think JJ starts the first step in September? I do. Uh, he's starting right now. Um, Brandon Ninnis has a boo-boo, and he's been out for a little bit. So, JJ is running with the ones like he should um, I think Brian Hartline wants to start him because, you know, if I'm if I'm Brian Hartline and I can start a true freshman wide receiver who's a monster, what is a better thing to sell to recruits than saying, hey, I'm not scared to start a true freshman. I'm not. Now, you got to make me start you. You got to be that dude. Like, J.J. Smith is that dude. He is the best receiver 
he, he probably could get out of the best receiver in school history. I mean, at this rate, I mean, he's unbelievable. He's already, you know, six, five to 25 uh, runs a four, four fast monstrous. I mean, he, he's 18 years old, but I mean, this guy, he's put in the work. He's genetically gifted. He puts in monstrous work. He's got a great personal trainer in Miami. I mean, those guys ran Hills in South Florida in the summer, hundred degrees. And again, Anybody can run hills, but these guys really got after it. And when they've tested this guy and his leg strength and his durability and his uh, endurance, he smashes every receiver on the roster. And he's 18. So, you know, I mean, I don't know how you bench that kid, but I think JJ, and again, we had it first. We were on this kid when he was a seventh grader. Uh, we've been on, been on him longer than anybody. So I'm glad everybody's catching up on the JJ Smith hype. So appreciate everybody uh, being JJ Smith fans. But, you know, the SFE guys love Buckeye Scoop, and we love them, so we appreciate them giving us that up. And guess what? Here's your next little tip. Angelo Smith, who's up here this weekend, is a freshman at Shamanah Madonna. Guess who his brother is? J.J. Smith. So guess who's going to be the next J.J. Smith? Angelo, who's a ninth grader. And uh, he doesn't look like J.J. He's got to fill out. But, you know, J.J., when he was Angelo's age, he looked like a little kid, too. So... Put in that work, uh, sprout like a little beanstalk, and away you go. So um, I'm just saying, it's uh, it's going to be very, very interesting, very, very fun to see uh, what Angelo can do next. Nevada, um, we'll get that uh, department patch badge, so just send that to me, barton.145 at gmail.com. Nevada, do you think J.J. Smith starts the first snap in September versus Akron? Yeah, I think it's going to be a Mecca, and it's going to be Carnell, and it's going to be JJ. I I don't think, I mean, short of something weird happening from here on out, I think that's pretty much preordained. And, uh, you know, as, as Kirk said, from a recruiting standpoint, there's no better advertising you can get for your program than to have those big, the, 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 the media loves those freshman phenoms, the next big thing. And JJ Smith is going to be one of the big stories in college football this year. And everybody's going to be watching him. Everybody's going to see this big old Marmaduke, the next Calvin Johnson, running around out there catching passes. And we get to see him for three years. So uh, enjoy every snap. But, yeah, I think he's going to take the first one for Iowa State. I'd be shocked if he wasn't the starter. Yep. And I think it's going to be fantastic. Donald and Karen Ross back. Thank you for the 10. And thank you for being an ultra member as well. Uh, these other these other teams are jealous because they're high state figuring out how it works. And as support of the foundation in 1870, who do the best of getting donations, be jealous while we win a natty. Nevada Buck, OH. I O. Yeah, I mean, you got to figure out ways to harness uh, the right people. The foundation has really um, some some really good ties, some good business ties, uh, you know, and that's critical. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a joke when you got to go against and, and go get some of these kids, man. It's uh it's the poor damn money, and and I think that it's uh it's gonna be bigger and bigger going forward, which again is fine. Uh, we have money. Um, you know, again, you just gotta keep replenishing the pot because the pot gets drained every year, and uh, we need more and more. But I think that uh, you know, we gotta figure it out. You know, and, and Ryan, you know, they're doing all these events now. You could bid on. I mean, eighteen seventies on this thing where you could bid on, uh, being with one of the coaches during pregame warm ups for. 1500 bucks or whatever. It's, it's like a, it, it'll be interesting to see what the bids end up at, but um, you can coach the, the, the Scarlet team and coach the gray team. So uh, I think it's going to be fascinating to see um, how high some of that stuff goes. Cause uh, it'll be cool. But again, they're, they're putting all these packages together because most of these packages don't cost any money. So why not do it? But I think it's going to be absolutely hilarious. Uh, super nerd. Thank you for the no, five. No, 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 no. Hold on. Oh hold on. my hold God. On. Go Hold ahead. On. Go ahead. No, no, I Let's hear it. You got, to, you got to put down in the comments, do we want to win the bid for Burt Carton to be like the guest coach so he can go out there and hang with, out with, with Ryan with, Day? With Ryan Day? Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Let's get the Super Chats going. Let's get Super Chats going. Let's see if you want Kirk Barton to win. Oh, the, my God. The bid. Do we bid? Do we bid on that? Do we enter the? Do we bid, bid ten thousand as... dollars to go stand next to Ryan Day? Just give up all of our super chests for the next ten years, yeah, just so we'll I can have... go stand with Ryan Day. And Kirk will wear his massive shirt and his Burt Carton jersey during the thing. Do you want to see that happen? Just put it in the comments. Do you want to see Kirk? And do we throw our hat in the ring 
and try to win the big bid for Kirk oh, Barton. It'd be, a, it'd be a chance for you to, to be on the sideline of a kind of a college football game, but not really a college football game. So that'd be kind of a big thrill for you because you've never done that before, right, Kirk? Ryan will have a running clock. If I win that, Ryan will have a running clock from the time they get off the bus. Like, I mean, they won't even, they won't even be out of the locker room. They'll start the running clock. It'll be done like, it'll be like a 40 minute extravaganza. They'll have like 75,000 people. Fox will be there. They'll be like, well, damn, Ryan, we were only here for 70, you know, 70 minutes round trip total. Normally we're here for four hours. Like, no, nah, well, we had to start that running clock because that guy was here. That, the Voldemort was in the building again. Which, <laughs> Oh God, I would. That would be like the greatest thing. I, and you know what's funny is if we did win that, I would make the biggest, like most ridiculously stupid, fake-looking credential laminated <laughs> thing, and I would, I would have it on my neck. It would look like a giant poster. It would look like it, it would just be like the size. It would look like a. It would look like a clock from a uh, Flavor like, Flav. Like, like yeah, Flavor yes, Flav. Like, exactly. <laughs> yes, like the credential would literally be bigger than Mark Piantoni. Like like side by side. If I had the credential sideways and Mark Piantoni, they're both four feet wide, tall, whatever. And it would, it would oh my god, it would be amazing. Say, let me in. I want to stand here so I can so I can just waft in Ryan Day's scent. Like I'm one of the beat reporters that are absolutely clueless. Please let me uh-huh. in. <laughs> super super nerd. Thank you for the five. Love you guys. Have a good weekend. Appreciate you, my man. I hope you have a good weekend, too. Appreciate the love. Uh, thanks for being in here all the time. Again, we grind away, man. It's Good Friday. Uh, so for all you Christians out there, this is a, a really good weekend with Easter and everything. So I hope you guys have fun with your families. Appreciate that, as always. Uh, Pooh Beard 12 thank you for the five. Oh, and thanks for being an ultra member. Here we go. This is what, this is what I like talking about right here. JJ and saying are going to be dangerous together would you bet on one either of them winning heisman two them being top <laughs> top two picks of the 27 draft i mean that is uh in the wildest of wildest buckeye land dreams and mock drafts but i i can't bet on them winning the heisman because we've had one quarterback win the heisman in the history of the program but if there's ever a guy that could do it it'd be julian um Top two picks, I mean, I can see saying being one. I just think that for JJ, I mean, to be a top two pick as a receiver, man, you've got to be, I mean, Calvin. I mean, Calvin was a top two pick. I, I think he went right after Jamarcus Russell in that uh, 07 draft. But, I mean, that's that's hard just because it's not because JJ's worthy, but, like, you look at Marvin – I mean, there's mock drafts that have Marvin fall to like nine now. They've got the I mean, there's a mock draft on Saturday that had the guy from LSU going before Marvin. So Marvin was really good, won the Blitnikoff, but it's such a quarterback centric league that if you've got a top two or three pick, man, I mean, these teams are dying to trade down to a quarterback needy team and slide down to get a guy who's a receiver. So Top two would be rich. I'm just saying. I mean, Randy Moss didn't go top two. Obviously, he had off the field stuff. Um, Jamar Chase didn't go top two. Uh, I think Calvin went two. Um, but I mean, to go top two as a receiver, you got to be god tier. And uh, JJ could be that. But I just think that you know, when you have like a superhuman freak of nature, sure thing, locked in receiver, those guys go down to four or five because. The last few drafts, like top two, three picks, unless there's a freak of nature defensive player, like usually an edge rusher, I mean, it's quarterbacks. Just because there's a lot of new GMs or there's a lot of guys that are on their last roll uh, to save their save their uh, time as a GM that need to take a quarterback. So, yeah, I I don't know, man. If Marvin's going to fall to four or five, like if JJ's as good as Marvin, which would be fantastic, you know, multi-year All-American Bolitnikoff winner, I, I, I still don't think he'd be too just because of how heavy uh, the drafts are towards quarterbacks. Nevada, your thoughts on that. Uh, JJ and John Sane will be dangerous together. Um, do you have either of them winning the Heisman or being top two picks in the 2027 draft? Yeah, tough. I mean, the, the Heisman generally goes to the best quarterback on the best team. So why couldn't Julian say? Because Julian Sane is going to be the quarterback of the future here. I really believe that. I think you know he'll be a multi-year starter at Ohio State, and um, I mean I love everything about that kid. So 
uh, you know, you, you'd, you'd want odds on something like that. But sure, would, would he have a chance to win the Heisman? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think you covered a pretty good ground on why wide receivers don't go as high in the draft. But JJ's, JJ's a good one, man. I, I'll put it this way. I, how high, what's the highest wide receiver we've ever had drafted? Who's the, who's the top wide receiver that we've ever had at Ohio State? You're the master of the draft. You know. Well, I mean, like I know, I know Garrett went top ten, and Olave. I mean, where did Boston go? Did Boston go like eight, maybe, or something like that? Like he went to Arizona. Um, Ted, well, Teddy went like seven, I think. I mean, I don't know if we had a guy go yeah. above seven. Where did Ted even go? Well, I, I'll, I'll predict right now. I think JJ Smith will be the top draft draft choice. Ohio State wide receiver that we've ever had. Teddy Teddy I Teddy think. went nine. Um, and, and again, there's probably somebody from back in 1970 when before I was born that might have went top five or something that I don't know. Uh, Boston went eight, so I was close there. Um, where did Paul Warfield go? Yeah, Chris Carter. Ask, Chris Carter went supplemental. So Warfield went uh, first round eleventh pick. So oh, wow. Boston Boston is the leader in the clubhouse right now. Uh, where did Garrett Wilson go? I mean, was he like nine ish? I feel like they both went in the top ten. I think that was like eight, nine, ten, where we went Wilson, Olave, J- JMO, JMO, yeah, yeah. Um, Really? Well, I mean, well, Wilson went 10, so it was probably 10, 11, 12. So Wilson, Olave, Jamo. So, yeah, what, yeah, so I mean, look, it, looks like Bo- it looks like Boston. I'm going to say J.D. Smith higher than David Boston in the draft. I will, I'll call that right now. Are you, uh, are you looking for Huckleberries to bet you on that one? Uh, I, I, dude, every time I try to put out there for bets, like these stupid Michigan fans that are like, Oh, yeah, I'll bet you. And then, then you ask them. And I'm, like, I'm like, serious, let's bet. And then they put the money up. up. You, you got to put the money in put, escrow. Stop playing. Put the money up. Put the money up, guys. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, I'm they, not, they, not going to. They don't want to put the money in escrow and put it in a holding account because they know they're going to get smoked. Yeah. And then, and then when you win and it's time for you to collect, then they all of a sudden delete their accounts and they're no longer, exactly. they're no longer active. So it's just like chasing your tail because they're stupid. Yes. This is I, I mean, I, I've had guys that have that they owe me money. Um, one of them's a, oh, yeah. one of, one of, one of them's a big time head coach right now. They, they, they they that. Never paid me, which hey, that's probably why we beat him in South Bend last year. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Joe, so Joey Galloway went eight, Terry Glenn went seven. Okay, so he's the oh, new leader God. in the clubhouse. Jenks went 29, San Antonio 25, Ted nine. So there you go. Uh, it's Terry Glenn seven. So I'm gonna there say you go. JJ JJ Smith higher than in the first six picks in the NFL draft. Um, I really believe that. I think he's got that kind of potential. Totally agree. I think that'll be good. Beach Buck, thank you for the ten. I agree uh, with Ryan Day. Amazing offseason, but let's be real. You keep backing him again. Missouri Ryan Day has three weeks to get Jibia or. Clean Klein age versus Clean Holtz, I'm sure. Ready. DB's history, uh, Devin Brown's history of injury. I want to see him as a coach, not OC. Um, I don't know. I don't really agree with that. I don't think Ryan Day had three weeks to get Tristan Gibbia, who's terrible. And was a seventh year guy who wanted to be a coach. Uh, we had no chance if we played that kid. And Lincoln, you know, again, he he was a scout team quarterback all year. I played scout team. I know on scout team you don't learn the playbook at all. Uh, so he didn't know the plays, and he he looked like he didn't know the plays, which is fine. I mean, he wasn't being counted on that year. But, like, when your quarterback, you know, pulls the rug out from under you and goes to Syracuse, which is fine. Um, and then Devin gets hurt. You know, I mean, they had to give – when Kyle McCord decided he was leaving, they had to give Devin Brown every rep – possible to try to get him ready to go for Missouri. Um, so they didn't have a lot to spare for Lincoln Keenholz. You know, Tristan Gibbia, I mean, we might as well just not even went to the game. Uh, he was so bad. Um, so I don't fault Ryan. You know, it would be like, you know, we, we always go back, we go round and round in circles, but it would be like if you had, like if you had Andy Reid coaching in the Super Bowl this past year and Pat Mahomes like broke his leg in the first half of the first quarter, like, I wouldn't blame Andy Reid if the backup quarterback sucked. 
whoever it was, you know, I don't even know who it is because it used to be Chad Henney and it was Chase Daniels and a million other guys. But whoever Pat Mahomes' backup was, if he went in there and sucked, I'd be like, well, I'm not blaming Andy Reid because he had Pat Mahomes. Like, you want to give Pat Mahomes every rep possible because you only have so much time to practice. You have two hours a day to practice in the NFL. You only have so many reps to go around in the NFL. So, kind of is what it is. Like, the backups don't get many reps. I've been in the NFL. I played in the NFL. Like, I didn't see the second and third team guys getting a ton of reps. The second team guy gets some guy, some, but the third guy sometimes doesn't even, you know, get any because he's an emergency quarterback. So, I don't know. Um, Nevada, uh, your thoughts, Beach Bucketing, and thank you for the 10. And this is this is a good thought right here, but he agrees uh, with Randy, amazing offseason, but he, uh, he says, let's be real. You keep backing him, <laughs> which I do because I think he does a good job. Uh, against Mizzou, Ryan Day had three weeks to get Tristan Jebbia, who is coaching somewhere now, didn't even try out for the NFL, and Lincoln Keenholz ready. Uh, when we know Devin Brown's injury history, which again, he got hurt in the Penn State game, um, and he wants to see Ryan Day as a head coach, not an OC. What are your thoughts on that, Nevada? Well, I, I, I agree that we want to see him as a head coach and, and not an OC. And I think that, you know, I think that'll be definitely beneficial. Um, I, I, we got to talk about the, the backup quarterback situation because there's like this popular myth that goes around that Cardell, that Ohio State won with their third string quarterback in 2014. And the, the reality is Braxton Miller went down before the year. So the entire season for, you know, four months, you have, JT Barrett taking the first team reps and Cardell Jones taking the second team reps. So he's actually getting the chance to practice, do his thing as a second team quarterback throughout the year. And then when JT Barrett went down, you know, they go, he was able to do some things as a fourth year guy or whatever he was, you know, older guy coming out of high school and um, magical run. And we win the national championship. Now I'll contrast that to this year. You have to remember Kyle McCord took all the first. So Kyle McCord is JT Barrett. And Devin Brown is Cardell Jones. So when Cardell Jones goes down, i.e. I, Devin Brown in the in the Cotton Bowl, now you're down to Lincoln Keenel. I don't even know who the fourth who was the fourth quarterback on that team. Uh, like who was the backup to Cardell Jones? I mean Darren Lee or something like that. I mean, I mean you're literally like I mean so that's what we were down to when Devin Brown went down. The, Devin Brown had taken all the second team reps during the season, but now you're down to the third team guy who's running the scout. Three weeks is not nearly enough time, especially when you're trying to get the second team guy up to speed because McCord's gone. So I just think we just didn't have a lot of good cards that time. It was a shame Devin got hurt because I, I thought he had a, an outstanding bull prep to that. But I really believe that that debacle was the spark that lit the fire that that has been this entire this crazy wonderful off season and it's kind of uh, taken us to another level it forced us into staff changes it forced us into you know making the hard decisions about the the uh about the roster making a renewed commitment to nil i think it all is the fruit of that bitter tree from the cotton bowl so i'm actually thankful for the cotton bowl because i'm not if we'd have won 24 to 3 or 24 to 10 and Devin had done just enough maybe we don't make all these changes and i think these changes we're necessary, and and we're going to be the benefactors of that in this wonderful 2024 season. Now that was a speech. Now that you can't think of who Cardell's backup was in 14. Darren Lee, Stephen Collier, hater. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I would I wouldn't have guessed that in a thousand years. And Stephen was a nice yeah. kid. Um, nice, but kid. you know, when you never and nice kid, but if you don't play, like it's hard to remember. And again, that's not slight on him, but you know, he uh really nice kid. Skips, thank you for the deuce. Appreciate you, my man. I hope you have a great weekend. If you have a question, toss it in the chat. Well, I think I got them all this time, Nevada, after I almost uh missed them. Yeah, you know, man, we've had a riot. Stranded. Oh People god, we, we've been... we've had it too. Yeah, they've been storming the castle there. We'd have hung up on them and like, what the heck just happened? I'm like, Kirk lost his mind, man. Oh, I'll, I'll tell him where to storm Michigan game. If you want the hottest cocoa in town, I'll tell you exactly where to go. You Man, walk in there and say, hey, you said that the cocoa would be hot and fresh. What's going on here? So Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's cram the sweet. Uh, all right, Nevada, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, 
before we get you in a lot of trouble and you get yelled at. Um, your thoughts uh, on uh, this weekend, and we'll uh, break this thing down. <laughs> uh, huge recruiting weekend. I think we're in for some other recruits uh, commitments starting tomorrow, so stay tuned. Um, also, huge crowd on, on Twitter Live tonight. If you, if you want to ask questions, come over from Twitter, come over to YouTube, subscribe to the channel. And uh, hit those, if you can super chat through the YouTube channel, which you can't do through Twitter. But if you want to super chat, come on over to YouTube. When we do we do these shows every night at 7 o'clock. Have a big crowd. But like I said, I've had a huge crowd tonight. I want to thank everybody for being here. But I'm I'm guaranteeing you at least one more commitment to this weekend. And if, if we don't get another commitment this weekend, then the show will be free. The show We will not charge anything for the show tomorrow night. But we will get other commitments. <laughs> Just on free show tomorrow night. The show will be free to watch. We promise you. We we promise. Oh my God, you're you're out of control. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut him off before he gets too wild on this Friday night. Appreciate you guys as always. Thank you for kicking with us. I hope you guys had a great week. Uh, it is the weekend now. March Madness is going strong uh, tonight. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. Gonna be grinding along uh, all weekend, giving you the latest content, student appreciation day tomorrow. We'll have a bunch of film to break down. So looking forward to all of that. If you guys enjoy this content, again, the likes are appreciated, the subscriptions are appreciated, and the alert, uh, clicking the alert, uh, make sure you never miss a live show. So shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Appreciate you guys as always. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Buckeye Nation, and thank you, Scoop family. We're gonna talk to you guys tomorrow. 7 p.m. Talk to you then. Go Bucks.